Grace and peace be to you on this day. I thank you so very much, every one of you, for subscribing and liking and following this channel and learning with me. And today, we're going to learn something that is um, it's a biggie. It, it's something that's very big and near and dear to my heart. I watched this video, and I'm going to play this video in a second. And I watched this video today, and it made me run for the word. It made me run to know, okay, Lord, what's wrong with this? Because I immediately felt and understood that there was something majorly wrong with the word that was being given. So I'm going to watch the video, and um, I'll be right back. What must we do to be saved? Paul gave a very simple answer. He didn't give a very complicated scientific mathematical formula. He simply said, and he was one of the most brilliant men of his day, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That word believe means commitment. I commit everything I've got to him. All right, thank y'all so much. Uh, welcome back. Now let's talk about this. So what this man is basically saying is, in order to be saved, all you have to do is ask Yeshua HaMashiach, ask Jesus the Christ to come into your life uh, as your Lord and Savior and you're saved. Okay? If you confess with your mouth, believe with your heart that Yeshua died and He is Lord, uh, you shall be saved. That sounds good, right? I mean... That is what we're taught, right? But there's something wrong with that. There's something very much wrong with that. And we're going to get into it today. All right. Through, I want to look at the church's reaction and the church's understanding of this scripture of how to be saved. So I'm going to ask you, how do you be saved? If what this man is saying is wrong, that means 90-something percent, almost 100 percent of all Christians are wrong. And it also means that they're not actually saved. Okay? So, in order to say such a big um, accusation against someone as well-known as Billy Graham, it is foolish to come into this without knowing full well what I'm saying. So, I went to the Word, I went to prayer, and I found some things that I want to share with you guys. So, without further ado, how do you actually get saved? Well, you actually get saved, and um, let's start with Acts chapter 15. We're going to read 6 through 11. Because they had the same thing come up in the book of Acts, of course. There were some believers who felt like um, you couldn't be saved. A Gentile could not be saved unless they were um, baptized and, I mean, unless they were circumcised and followed the law of Moses. Okay, excuse me. So let's start in verse 6. Uh, it says, Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore... Why do we test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the dis disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Okay, so this is kind of sort of seems like it's saying the same thing, right? But let's look closer. All right, let's go back up to the top and let's start in verse seven. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So 
He's referring to when he spoke with Cornelius and his household. Okay. And a bunch of apostles, a bunch of people were there with him. Okay. So I want to peek at that story real quick because there's something in the beginning of that story of Cornelius that is going to get you guys to understand what I'm saying. Okay. So Acts chapter 10 verses one through three. Here we go. There was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. All right, let's stop right there. So we're going to look at his what he did. OK, so, yes, he was a, a Gentile, but he was a devout man. OK, if someone is devout in something, they're all in. OK, they're not just Joe Blow off the street. They are fully understanding what they're doing. OK, so basically he is already following the Jewish faith. He is a man who um, feared God with all his household. OK, so the fear of Yah was already in him. Of course, we know that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, right? Um, according to Solomon, with all his wisdom. And we understand that this man feared God. So he had wisdom. He had understanding of the Jewish ways. So he probably was practicing Jewish tradition already. He was probably already, he had to have been, okay, walking out the law already. All right. And it says, uh, and gave alms generously to the people. So he gave, um, not tips, but he gave, you know, he gave money to people. Um, he tried to meet people's needs. He tried to show that he was a um, a believer like them. All right. And his heart were for the people. All right. Um, so he was not a regular person. And that's what I want you guys to understand. So what Peter is referring to here when he's telling everybody else that, you know, by his mouth, the Gentiles were saved. Yes, he went to Cornelius's house, but Cornelius was not an ordinary Gentile. Okay. He was not someone who didn't know the law. So what we're saying here is there's people back then who knew the law, who walked in it already. And Yah made sure that those people entered into his kingdom with all of their household. Okay. That's what this story is all about. All right. Now, let's go back to Acts 15. But we're going to go down to uh, 18 through 21. Uh, and we're going to find out a little bit more. 18 says, Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. But that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. All right, let's break this down. What he's saying here is, OK, what we should tell the Gentiles to do is uh Abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual morality, from things strangled, and from blood. Where do we get that from? That is actually out of the law of Moses. That's from the law of Moses. So he's telling people that they need to start with something in the law of Moses. Not that this was the full thing, that this is all they had to do. He was simply telling them, I want you guys to have a starting point. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. I say that because in verse 21, 
He says, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So what are you supposed to do in church? OK, so basically he's giving the people a starting point so that when they get to the synagogue, they already have a starting point. So they can walk into a synagogue, right, and sit and listen. What are they listening to? They're not listening to westernized sermons. They're listening to the law of Moses being preached in every city, every Sabbath, in every synagogue. So that means in the Western world, every church is supposed to be on the Sabbath, Saturday, preaching, teaching from the law of Moses. The, the Christian church is a, a New Testament church. They don't believe really in the Old Testament like that. They cite the Old Testament to, to talk about Yeshua. But Yeshua is always talking about the Old Testament. Okay. So what I want you guys to gather from this is basically the simple fact that you have to obey the commands in Yeshua. Okay? That is how you get saved. So what are you doing when you say the sinner's prayer? When you say the sinner's prayer, you're basically going back to Mount Sinai and you are agreeing to all the terms of the first covenant. By accepting Yeshua, it is already understood that you know and understand what they were already practicing. Okay, all right, that doesn't make any sense. So let me start with this. Yeshua was teaching uh, Jews. He went to the Jews, right? So the Jews were already practicing the law of Moses, okay? So he didn't have to tell them, you have to practice the law of Moses. They were already doing it, okay? It was broken up into different sects, okay? You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, and the teachers of religious law, all right? The Pharisees, they upheld the rabbinical law. So they added to the law of Moses almost everything that you could imagine, okay? So... The thing about that is Yeshua was against them, telling them, hey, you're doing too much. I didn't tell you to do this. You're making this into something it's not supposed to be. Go back to basics. OK, so you will see a, a, a group of believing um, people. A group of the believing um, Jews. And. What the believing Jews did were they accepted Yeshua HaMashiach. They accepted Jesus the Christ on top of the other law of Moses. Okay, not the rabbinical law, but the law of Moses. So they were considered believing Jews. So that's the people that the apostles and um, Peter, I mean Paul, would go to. And then they would bring in whoever else was hanging around. So if you had friends that were Gentiles, then they would all come in and they would understand and get taught. But they always went back to people who already understood the law of Moses. Now, there's a part in this that the, um, the, uh, there were some believing um, Pharisees and I can't find it right now. I'm looking for it as I'm talking. So I'm pretty distracted, but there's, some um, believing Pharisees who came up with the plan and said, well, no, what they need to do is be circumcised and obey the law of Moses. But through disputes and do different things, they came up with this way that I just now read in Acts 15, saying that, hey, let's not put all of that on them just yet. Like that's kind of a heavy load to hit them with all at one time. So let's not put all of that on them, but let's start here. OK. And then by them listening to the word every Sabbath, understanding what the law of Moses said they're supposed to do, they will start to walk in it and operate in it automatically. 
Now let's skip to a westernized world. No one is following the Jewish um, commands. No one is following the law of Moses automatically. So we have to, we can't start where Yeshua uh, started because he was already talking to people who were practicing Jews. They were already devout. They were already walking it out. Okay. Now we have to start with people who don't know anything about anything. Even this Roman centurion was much further ahead of the westernized world because he was already devoted. He was already devout. He was already walking in all of the commands. So we have to teach um, westernized people how to follow the commands, how to do everything. We gladly accept Yeshua and Yeshua gladly comes into our hearts and he starts doing his work. But because we do not follow um, his commands, we end up kind of forcing Yah, forcing God to push us away. And God pushes us away, not because he hates us, but because he's too holy and he can't dwell with us all the time. So without us even understanding what's happening, a lot of times um, another spirit will come in and take over and God's Holy Spirit is not there anymore. OK, uh, we quench the Holy Spirit every time we disobey. Whenever we go to church and we read a couple verses of the New Testament, um, we're not learning anything because everybody in the New Testament was simply regurgitating what was in the Old Testament. OK. So I want you guys to understand this. This right here is an abomination. When people like Billy Graham got up there, spoke to tens and twenties and hundreds of millions of people, every church does his sermons right now, today. They all believe the exact same thing. Oh, all you got to do is call on the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Why? Because that's what it says throughout the Bible. But you got to understand who the Bible was for and who it was talking about. It was not talking about Gentiles who were westernized, who didn't know anything about anything. It was talking to people who already knew. Paul was talking to people that were like himself. He was not talking to people that didn't know anything about the word. So we take these pastors, take it and they they make a mockery of the true word of Yah because of their foolishness and they don't know what they're talking about. They're not drawing um, from past experiences because they don't have any. They're not drawing from wisdom of the Holy Spirit because they don't have her. Billy Graham foolishly sent millions of people to hell. And he will have to reckon with that. Every pastor is sending tons of people to hell because they don't know what they're signing up for and they're never told the truth. Now, it is true that the Bible does not 100 percent clearly tell you every little thing that you have to do to be saved. But I'm telling you what it's pointing to. I mean, in the book of Revelation, it does tell you who the redeemed are, and they're the only people that are going to be saved. Even Yeshua said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will be saved. OK. So you have to follow the commands. You have to go back to the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all of that. Back to the law of Moses, back to the, the books of Moses and read and understand what you're reading. Break it down. Pray about it. Sleep on it. Allow the Holy Spirit to breathe on that word and show you what you're supposed to be doing, which is acting out the law of Moses, acting out the feasts and festivals. Let me talk about one more thing real quick. Okay. So there's this thing saying that you don't have to be circumcised. Okay. But in order to, and I, I've already done a video on this, in order to celebrate the very first festival, which is Passover, you have to be circumcised. 
because Passover is only for people who are in the family, either that are bought with money or bought by Yeshua, okay, nowadays, or who are of the lineage of the Jews, okay? They all have to be circumcised. And that's the only people that can um, celebrate the Passover. So in order for you to walk out everything that y'all called you to do, you, the males have to be circumcised. Females don't, of course, we know that. But the males have to be circumcised. So the Pharisees in the book of Acts 15, and let me try to find this because I, I really want to show you guys this. Uh, give me just a second. Let me let me see. OK, here it is in in um, Acts 15, verse five. It says, but some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed. So they already believed in Yeshua. And of course, they're already walking out the law of Moses rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, you will see in verse six, no one disagreed with that. What they disagreed with is the load of putting on people at one time. It's a heavy load. OK, it's a lot. It's culture shock to tell people you got to do all these things to be saved. But if you give it to them in bite sized pieces, they're going to walk it all out anyway. So that's what they were doing. This Pharisee was right in a westernized world. This is the sum total of everything we're supposed to do. They're absolutely right. But what they disagreed with was the way which you do that. You can't just throw somebody into something and tell them this is what you have to do because y'all wants their heart. Not everybody who starts on this journey will end on this journey. OK, look at the parable of the sower of the seeds, the different seeds who got taken out in different ways. The enemy is always standing by to pull people out of the faith. So not everybody that starts will finish. So that's why you don't circumcise them up front, because they have this false sense of I've been circumcised, so I'm good. Just like in the West, you know, you got this false sense of, oh, I accepted Jesus, so I'm good. No, no, because Yah does not have your heart. Your heart is not for the things of God. You have to have all of it. All or nothing. So if you're not walking in all of it, you're walking in none of it. Just like if you are guilty in one part of the law, if you break one commandment, then you are guilty of them all. Okay? And I want to tell y'all one more thing. All right? And then I'm going to go with this. Cowards do not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Why don't cowards inherit the kingdom of heaven? They don't inherit the kingdom of heaven because they could not overcome the world. They could not overcome themselves. They could not overcome their own desires. Okay? Our desire is to be lazy. We want to take the easiest way out. Our desire is to uh, go after whatever, however the wind blows. Whatever the new wave of thing is at the moment is our, is our desire. Okay? We don't have like stickability really our attention span is getting shorter and shorter we can't even watch 20 minute videos we like little tiktok videos because they're only one minute long and we can go into something else but what i want to tell you guys is cowards don't enter the kingdom of heaven you cannot be a coward and get in you cannot say i'm just going to sprinkle some jesus on me and everything is going to be okay that is only your introduction into the kingdom of Yah. That is the very first step. And that's it. You got a whole lot else you got to walk out. So I invite you guys, as I always do. Repent. Learn. Obey. 
and be able to teach your family and friends. Until the next video, thank y'all so much for watching. I really do appreciate each and every one of you. I appreciate each and every one of you subscribers. And I would like for everybody to subscribe. Follow along. Let's learn together. We got a lot to learn. We'll see you on the next video.